the topic today is sampling. So in criminal justice, there are three basic strategies for collecting data. Uh, they're based around what you call empirical. Empirical's the senses, touch, smell, taste, see. Uh, generally, it's involving asking questions, making observations, and examining the written records. So asking questions, uh, survey methodologies are used a lot in criminal justice and the other social sciences. Um, they are a very common application and most people uh, are aware of um, survey methods, how to respond to them. Um, in criminal justice, we have several big surveys. The Uniform Crime Report, which uses crime data, has surveys attached. Uh, but the other one that accesses what they call the dark figure of crime, that is the, cr the aspect of crime that is not reported officially, is the National Crime Victim Victimization Survey. And what this does is track uh, victims over time to see how um, the crime is manifesting from the point of view of uh, victims. Uh, another way of asking questions is focus groups, where you get a small group of people together uh, who are linked by certain characteristics, maybe police officers or correction officers, inmates, offenders, uh, and you ask them a set of questions. Uh, this is a little different from survey methods because you're also looking at the interaction in this group and how that interaction can facilitate discussions and information. A second component is making direct observations. Uh, this moves away from a survey where you may interact with someone. Observations can be done in a social context, such as police, uh, courts, corrections, and other areas of criminal justice. And we're observing behavior or the physical environment, and often without interacting with the participants themselves. Um, this can be combined with other ways of generating data. Of course, there's practical issues in criminal justice um, that may prevent uh, the use of observations and we merge these things. Uh, there's also certain risks that uh, one must think about when observing, such as uh, if you're observing crime taking place like a drug sale or a, a gang activity or violence. Um, so people have to be careful when conducting this research to make sure they do it safely. Uh, we also uh, gather information through the written record, and this can be uh, all types of institutional data that's recorded or other types of records. Uh, it could be something like a, uh, a, a diary or a journal that's kept by offenders or other types of things that are written down. When you're examining the written record, uh, you must uh, understand where the data is coming from, uh, ask questions. Uh, with each step, as other people interact with the data, you can lose control of it. Um, so often it's best to have it go directly from the participant to the researcher. Uh, sampling is based on the logic of probability sampling. And the goal here is to generalize from observed cases <clears throat> to unobserved cases, from a small group to a big group. In most cases, it's not cost effective nor even possible to sample an entire population. Uh, therefore, we sample and then we make inferences from the sample uh, based on statistics um, to a broader population. Of course, the question then is what type of sample uh, is the most appropriate for a sample design, which of course is dependent on what a researcher is trying to study. So the terms that we use for a probability sample is that it is uh, a special type of a sample that generalizes to a large population. And the goal of random distribution and random selection, which is a key part of science, means that every member within this group has an equal chance or an equal probability of being selected. This is a very basic assumption, though uh, it's an important one for research. Sampling is also based on the idea that as humans, we have uh, both con conscious and, and subconscious or unconscious forms of sampling. Uh, 
So for example, if we wanted to find more information on lawyers at a courthouse, uh, we could think it's quite simple to walk up and maybe ask the first 100 lawyers uh, a certain set of questions. Um, but there's bias that's introduced. We may have uh, some sort of notion of what lawyers are like. We may favor a certain gender or a certain uh, a lawyer dressed a certain way. Um, this is not a very effective way to collect data because without this randomization, a person or a researcher or a scientist, uh, just by being human, will introduce bias. Some, as I mentioned, will be uh, aware, the person might be aware of that bias. Um, and the bias could be straight, quite simple, such as um, I don't want to be at the courthouse uh, of a late of an evening time, and so I'm just going to go in the morning, and I'm aware of that. It's still a bias. Um, it can also be unbiased, and the person may not even be aware that they have such a bias. Bias is a part of research. Um, unless you're collecting an entire population, it will exist. Uh, it does not mean that the research is uh, to be destroyed or not going to work, um, but we should take efforts with our sampling design to minimize the bias. And when we cannot minimize or avoid it, then we must acknowledge it, particularly in our publications, uh, to identify where that uh, the sampling bias or our approach uh, has some uh, deficits. So one of the key components of probability sampling is that the sample is representative of a broader population. So when we're looking at a set of characteristics, they should approximate the characteristics of um, the broader population. Gender is uh, fairly close. Um, there's a l more than 50% of women, but it's generally pretty close to a 50-50 split between men and women. So if somebody had a, uh, a gender a bias, and um, they did not use a sampling technique, uh, gender would control the experiment, as opposed to the use of sampling techniques that can control for these types of uh, differences. In terms of probability, um, there's a greater likelihood in a probability sample that it will be representative of the population. And this is compared to a non-probability sample, which is the example earlier with the lawyers of just picking whoever comes to the courthouse. Uh, that will have uh, more bias because it's not representative of all the lawyers going to the courthouse. Uh, so representation means that uh, it's a, a, a probabil probability sample that everyone has an equal likelihood that they'll be involved. One of the most interesting challenges uh, of bias and intuition is what they call the Monty Hall problem. The Monty Hall problem is a very interesting topic uh, because it's a brain teaser in the form of a probability puzzle. Uh, it comes from an old game show called Let's Make a Deal and the original host was Monty Hall. And uh, the question was first posed in a statistical journal, uh, but then it was later sent to a, a letter to Marilyn uh, Voss Savant in a column that she used to have, uh, Ask Marilyn. And she was, uh, uh, or is a genius that had uh, um, the highest IQ recorded. And the question that was posed to her is, suppose you're on a game show, such as let's make a deal, and you're given the choice of three doors, and behind one door is a car, and behind the others are goats. And you pick a door, let's say door one, and the host, Monty Hall, who knows what's behind the doors, opens another door, let's say door three, and there's a goat. He then says to you, do you want to pick door number two, or do you want to remain with door number one? So the question was posed, is it in your interest uh, to switch? Uh, the answer that she posed was that using probability, the switching strategy uh, increases the chance of two thirds or two over three probability of winning the car by making a switch. The probability of staying with your first choice of number one only has a one over three probability. Now, there was a lot of debate over this and people wrote um, dissertations and statistical journals had the question and analysis. And they all seem to uh, indicate that it was in fact 
correct that switching the door based on probability uh, was the correct option. The problem and the interesting thing is that it's often paradoxical or counterintuitive to what your intuition says, which is it really does, doesn't make much difference that you may as well stay with door one or it's the flip of a coin, it's 50-50. Uh, there's similar mathematical approaches. Uh, criminal justice has one called the three prisoners problem or the three prisoners dilemma. And there's another one called Bertrand's box paradox. And you can do more reading on this. Um, it's quite complicated. Uh, it's quite interesting. Uh, but probability is uh, uh, usually more uh, uh, of a guidance for decision making. Um, when used appropriately because our intuition is often wrong. And that is one of the uh, underlying premises of uh, probability theory. So sampling also rests on probability theory and there's some important words to uh, cover. Uh, th the examples used here are often used in voting because it's, a, it's intuitive. So this is a voting example. And if you wanted to know who was voting, um, the, you start with the broadest area, which is who do you want to generalize to? And that's your theoretical population. In this case, it's everybody in the United States. The next one is what population uh, can you get access to? And that, so this is a study population. This may be different from the theoretical population. Uh, there may be reasons for that. Um, a lot of this, particularly in voting, has been the change in uh, phones and technology. Uh, before, uh, people would do phone calls and they could access a lot of the population, uh, particularly at night at four or five or six o'clock when families are having dinner and there was no answering machine and people would pick up the phone and you would get a quick uh, question, who are you voting for? And voting uh, probabilities were very accurate about picking the winner. This is much different these days with cell phones and technology. Um, but the important word here is the sampling frame. This is how you, what population you get access to and how can you access them. The sampling frame is a theoretical idea of who is the total list of all people who could be in your sample that you could access. And then your individual sample is who is in your study. Who have you actually uh, placed in your sample? Now, a person may be in your sample um, but they may not have completed a survey or responded. So for example, in the voting example, uh, if you called somebody on the phone and they answered, they are in your sample. Uh, if they answer three questions and hang up, um, they are still part of your sample, but it would be called something like a non-response or an incomplete sample. But uh, in terms of sampling technique, they're in the sample. So the sampling frame is often uh, the most important thing to focus on here for research because uh, in criminal justice, it, it's usually can you obtain a list? Uh, can you a a obtain some sort of a, a mailing list or contact list? And that would represent an appropriate sample that you can then uh, work towards a population. So the sampling frame is the listing of the accessible population from which you'll draw your sample. Uh, one common example would be to go into a jail or prison where all inmates um, are provided a inmate number when they enter prison. And your sample frame could be um, all of all inmates within, let's say, a prison within a certain state. Um, but you could also do uh, staff uh, samples such as all correctional officers or all police officers when, within a particular law enforcement department. Um, and your sampling frame may exclude somebody. So, for example, in the inmate example, uh, you could go into a prison and there could be parts of a prison that um, uh, you cannot access as a researcher. So this might include a lockdown unit, a person in isolation, a person in a mental health hospital within a prison, and they would not be included in your sample frame because you could be justified to say they are not accessible, or it could also be that they are not um, part of the study. For example, if you're looking at OBGYN services in inmates, uh, it would not make sense to sample male inmates uh, if you wanted a feedback on the services. So you would sample only female, your sample frame would be only female uh, 
uh, inmates. And then you could draw a sample from within the sample frame. So the sample that you would select from the sample frame is the group of people who you select to be in your study. So in the previous example, uh, you may have a sample frame of all females um, uh, in, in a state prison system who have had uh, OBGYN uh, 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 interactions or, or visited a doctor while incarcerated. The sample would then be uh, some sort of selection within that sample frame. You may not have access or costs or the time to uh, uh, to use your research to get uh, access to all of those people. So how you sample from the sampling frame, those, those people would be the ones that you would try to contact, observe, or uh, get the written record, referring back to the earlier kind of methods of how we generate data. So probability sample, uh, the ultimate goal of probability is to look at a sample uh, along a set of elements or descriptions and using the statistics of the sample, then make uh, uh, using statistics, we can find out how accurately this represents the parameters of the population. Now, there's a bunch of fancy words there. Uh, one easy way to remember it is that statistics apply to your sample, so that's S, and parameters apply to the population. Now, there are studies where somebody will access an entire population. Uh, that does happen. But in most cases, if the population is really big, it's not feasible. So we use our statistics in sampling to make estimates of the parameters in the population. And down there, you can see an easy way to remember that. So an example here is, um, if you were to do a survey, let's say, the variable that you'd be ticking on a survey, the person might select four. The, the statistic for the sample that we're using here is an average, which an average for your sample is 3.75 when you average everybody in the sample up. And then you would make uh, inferences to the population parameter, which may be a little off. It may be 3.72 we can see that the 3.75 is fairly close and we'll move on to those topics in a little bit about errors. So how do we get from our sample statistic to an estimate of the population parameter? So in this example, we have three different surveys. We have uh, a survey with a group of people, let's call them group one, group two and group three. We take an average of these three samples, this is our sample statistics, and we are left with three averages. And then we put them across uh, a sampling distribution. And if we did this with more than three, let's say an infinite number of samples, it would end up looking like it looks below in, in this bell-shaped curve. So the distribution of an infinite number of samples of the same size is known as the sampling distribution. So the reason that we talk about sampling distribution is because we recognize that taking a sample doesn't tell us the exact true measure of what the population is. And mistakes can be made. We want to estimate what that error could be. So if we take the average of all of these sampling distributions, and this gets a little bit tricky, it's the average of the averages of an infinite number of samples, we're going to get much more closer to the population average. We're going to be more accurate with what the true uh, value would be. So each sample, let's say 10 people, has an average. And if you keep taking the average of all those samples and you do it for an infinite number of samples, we're going to be closer and closer to what the real number would be. So to restate, by chance, we can always expect some difference between a sample, whether it's randomly selected or not, and the population from which we take the sample. Social science uses a standard rule, and you'll see this in publications, of 0 0.5. And this is true for psychology, um, 
criminal justice, sociology, and a range of other social sciences. It's kind of the ex accepted measure, and there's journal articles and other information on why this is, and there's also criticism of why this is used. In some cases, um, in tables, you'll see that people use uh, an error of 0 0.10. Um, this is just a standard practice in social science. It's beyond my presentation, but it's worth reading a little more about, about why we pick 0 0.5. So in sampling error, um, this is our error from when we take a sample and then generalize to a, a population. So in terms of a voting, uh, a voting example, um, people conducting polls will generally prov provide what they call a margin of error. You'll see this during elections. They'll say uh, candidate A is winning uh, right now in relation to candidate B, plus or minus. 2% or 3% or a margin of error or some other statistic to tell you. Within this kind of range is where we think the true answer is. It's worth noting that outside of social science, that margin of error has to be small. Uh, if you're an engineer and you're building a bridge, constructing a tower, uh, a large building or you're in medicine where you're dealing with cells and very small units or uh, very uh, precise units, you'll also see sampling errors of 0 0.01 or 0 0.001. This is worth noting that this is a little, this is more of a standard of practice between social science and other disciplines. Here's another way to think about sampling error. On the left, we have a population of grades. Let's think about a classroom. And if you take an average or a mean score of the population, the average score for this exam, this final exam, was 71.55. If you took a sample from the population, and here we have three different samples, you'll see that they produce three different averages. One is 75.75, one is 62.62, and one is 68.25. None of the three hit the exact number. They're all in the ballpark, so we need to understand what the error is in relation to the population. The standard error is also called the sampling error, and it gives us some idea of the precision of the estimate that we provide. Here is where things get really interesting. This is called the 68-95-99% rule. Uh, the 99 part is actually technically 99.7. You'll see it it's stated as that, 68, 95, 99.7. Um, but what drives us here is most human behaviors in social science, when you look at a group of people, will fall with this, within this type of um, distribution. And what that means is about 68% of all the cases will fall in between uh, the, the first area, the first standard deviation. About 95 all will occur in the second standard deviation and 99.7 or 99 just to be straightforward will fall in the third deviation. Now this may be confusing for people who are not mathematically inclined, but one important thing to take away is people as individuals are very difficult to explain and predict. They're unpredictable and statistics cannot really do a great job about telling you what an individual person will do. However, when you group people, they tend to be much more predictable and statistics and sampling can be used to define, explain and predict all sorts of behaviors, actions, perceptions and so on. So this is what we call the normal curve. And you can see at the bottom, uh, standard deviations, uh, one, and you see one negative. So you can be one standard deviation, negative or positive. Outside of the three standard deviations in each way, uh, you're left with really 0.03, in this case 0.02 uh, of remaining cases, whether it's an IQ test, whether it's an exam, whether it's crime, whether it's victimization, 
these this is a normal curve and this is used to explain a lot of human behavior individuals who are in these small areas outside are what you call outliers they are outside of 99.7 percent of the rest of the population um, so they tend to be unusual in that way uh, but in the middle people are predictable in height this would mean people who are extremely tall or extremely short now, IQ, I believe, has since jumped up from an average of 100, uh, but let's assume it's 100. You can see that one standard deviation would mean that most people, 68% of people, have a standard deviation uh, of an IQ between 85 and 115. 95% uh, uh, of people, which is the second standard deviation, have an IQ that goes ranges between 70 and 130. And 99.7 of all people uh, will have an IQ score of 55 to 145. Of course, now we're dealing with the 0.02 or 0.03 outliers that will be uh, under 55 or over 145 for the IQ test. IQ, as I mentioned, is just one uh, dimension or one concept that we can see the normal curve applying. I will mention that the normal curve is not always this shape and there's different statistics um, that can be used. Um, sometimes there's bimodal curves and sometimes the outliers can be so extreme that it can change the shape of the curve. Uh, rather than be a hump in the middle, it will be one side to the other. Uh, income is an example of that. Um, there's a cluster of people um, that earn around the same amount of money, though there's a few individuals that earn so much money that it does change the shape of the curve. It's not bell-shaped like we see as one tail gets dragged by a few outliers that don't have just a little more than three standard deviations, but a whole lot more money, particularly when you involve <coughs> wealth and investing and companies and other um, monetary uh, measurements. So how do we figure out the, sa the sampling error? Well, first of all, it is based on these standard deviations that we just discussed. The greater the standard deviation, the greater the standard error, and the greater the sampling error. So the more that that bell curve is stretched out and spread out, the more the standard error occurs, which makes sense because if you imagine that the bell curve is compressed then you know that the data that we're receiving all falls around the same area with not a great deal of range the sampling error is also a function of sampling size an inverse relationship and this makes sense too if we were to use the voting example and you can imagine that getting a sample size of 100,000 Americans to generalize to the entire population is probably going to have less uh, error than if you took a sample size of five people and then tried to generate uh, uh, estimates of the entire US population. So the more that the sample size increases, the more that the standard error decreases. This also is based on probability, which is the idea that as the sample size increases, uh, the true value will be clustered closer to the estimates of these samples. So if we have a sampling distribution, we can then predict our confidence intervals for where the actual true value or the population parameter should be. But we don't tend to have this. But what we do have is a distribution for, for the sample or multiple samples. We can take that distribution and then we can estimate using the standard error or the sampling error because it's based on the same type of bell curve and standard dif distribution that we already have. So if we look at this case, uh, we have our bell curve and we find out that our sampling distribution uh, has is is a mean of 3.75 and a standard error of 0.25 we can then see 
based on our um, averages that one standard de deviation or 68% of the cases will fall between the value of 3.725 and 3.775. Okay, so we're taking 3.75 um, and subtracting 0.02 because that's one standard deviation and we're taking 3.75 and we're adding 0 0.025 and then that gives us one standard deviation and the same applies as we move to our second standard deviation the 95 percent and our third uh, standard deviation we just keep adding or subtracting the value of 0.025 which is our standard error So how do we design our sampling approach uh, in order to then generate these type of statistics and estimates? Uh, there's generally two types of sampling techniques, probability and non-probability sampling. Uh, they both have their strengths and weaknesses. There's no one true model. Some are appropriate for some situations. Uh, some are not feasible or even ethical in other situations. Uh, they are linked, however, to the statistics that you can use to uh, make those uh, estimates towards the population parameter or the true value that we're uh, trying to access here. Uh, probability sampling, importantly, is linked to probability statistics. So you'll see things like a regression analysis structural equation modeling and other forms of quantitative uh, research that rest on probability sampling. Non-probability sampling does not involve this approach, uh, and but however, there are non-probability statistics that can be used to analyze the data. So probability sampling, our first category, has simple random sampling, systematic sampling, stratified sampling, disproportionate stratified sampling and multi-stage. So simple uh, random sampling, you, uh, the goal here is to select your sample from your population so that every individual has an equal chance of being selected. In systematic sampling, you're selecting every, in this case, K or 10th, 15th, 20th, 3, 2, it can be any sort of, uh, uh, equal kind of measurement and you're selecting every unit within a total list. This is superior to the simple approach which is often based on convenience because the elements are arranged in a way to reduce bias. Uh, you might have heard the word decimate and this was a form of systematic sampling where after losing a battle every tenth soldier decimate was executed. So they would just count down the line one, two, three, up to 10, and then to 20, and then to 30, and so on. And the reason that this removes bias is you're not uh, looking at every individual soldier and deciding one-on-one uh, -on -one based on uh, their looks, their gender, their race, their warrior spirit, or some other um, bias technique, um, but you are just literally counting every 10th which was where decimate comes from. So in a similar fashion, a systematic sampling, uh, you may conduct an interview with every 10th or every 15th or every third inmate that was booked into a jail. Uh, you may do a systematic sampling uh, with every um, third uh, 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 lawyer that arrives at the courthouse. Um, in some sort of um, <coughs> systematic approach that rules out uh, or reduces bias. So here's another example in systematic uh, sampling. Um, you're looking for, um, you have 100 in your sampling frame, or let's say 100 people, and you number them 1 through 100. Um, you want to take a sample out of this population of 20, and so you pick uh, every uh, fifth, you select a random number and you get number four, which is in the left column. You see it highlighted in blue. And so starting from four, then you then take every fifth um, person and, and conduct a survey. So number four, number nine, um, 
number 14, number 19, and you do this with every um, every fifth person on the list, and then you get your systematic sampling for a total of 20 people. Um, this is one technique that is also supposed to reduce bias. Now in stratified sampling, um, we're moving beyond a straight um, selection of say every fifth, and we're looking at groups that are homogenous in some ways. They, you're drawing from a group of a subset of a population. You get more representat representativeness, that's a hard word, by decreasing um, the error that's involved. So let's say in this case, um, you, you have M&Ms and you have brown M&Ms and yellow M&Ms and, you know, I don't know what color that is, orangey M&Ms, but they make up different uh, proportions of um, a population. So from the top brown M&Ms, you take five uh, using some sort of sampling technique there, stratified sampling. Uh, from the next, you take three and then you take six. Disproportionate is a similar approach, um, but rather than have a true representation on some variable, okay, such as uh, being arrested or being a, a police officer, um, you recognize that there's differences within the group and you may oversample one group. So you'll often see this in minority groups. Um, let's say you want to get feedback from law enforcement um, and um, they, there is not a great deal of minority law enforcement officers in the department. Um, let's say African Americans, which is about 13% of the population. And you go in and there's only 5% of the workforce is African American, you know, less than half. So you would oversample from that group so they meet uh, that 13% and therefore are represent representative of uh, the broader population. Uh, this can extend beyond demographics such as age, gender, race. It can also be all sorts of variables where you know that um, you need to sample a particular area more uh, in a stratified method in order to get a representation of um, the broader population. A multi-stage cluster is similar. Uh, but you go through multiple steps. Uh, you compile an exhaustive list, so it may not just be an issue of race. It may not be one particular factor, like a psychological screen or something like that. But it's a process of repeatedly listing and then sampling within each list. It can uh, be efficient, but has accuracy issues. Non-probability sampling. Uh, naturally is the other aspect of sampling apart from probability sampling. And it does not necessarily require a sampling frame. Um, and it does introduce uh, some bi <coughs> bias because we're drawing conclusions um, that with a sample that may not be uh, representative of uh, a, a population. Um, the lack of this random selection uh, can also influence what type of statistics are used. Um, and uh, once again, this doesn't mean better or worse. A lot of times it just means uh, what type of uh, research design we have and how we're going to apply it. And ethics and costs and other factors come into to play, uh, particularly in criminal justice. So often in non-probability, we're accessing available uh, subjects, we now use the word participants um, uh, or some sort of convenience sampling. Uh, there's also a purposive sample, quota sampling, and snowball sampling. So uh, some studies, and starting at the most uh, con convenient, therefore that's a word for this, convenience samples, uh, we're looking at available participants such as inmates, offenders, students, and passerbys on the street. They uh, are not chosen randomly, and therefore the bias uh, increases, and so do any sort of estimates towards the population, and it increases sampling error. Uh, in research methods term, it also reduces the external validity of the study, 
Um, and so these are some things that we need to consider because uh, the, the increase of bias is also influenced by a lack of representation. Uh, in social science, you'll see um, a lot of studies that uh, may use convenience samples based on university students because a researcher can go into a uh, introduction class and access two or 300 students, say, in, in one um, setting and uh, provide a bunch of uh, surveys or collect data because it's convenient. Uh, but we have to recognize that uh, the, uh, a university sample is different from those outside of a university uh, by a number of factors such as demographic factors, psychological factors, background characteristics, etc. Uh, and so we're, then it makes it very difficult to generalize to populations outside of those students. Even within a university, uh, there's also increased bias that a, uh, a particular um, uh, topic or, or classroom that a person is in, whether it be psychology, criminal justice, sociology, etc., cetera, um, the students within that particular discipline or that class may also uh, have certain characteristics that make them different from other students at the university and people beyond the university. So convenience samples are used a lot um, and they are based on the convenience or reliance of who is available. So purposive or judgmental sampling is another step up. Uh, it does con contain a level of convenience, but uh, the people, the participants that are placed in the sample uh, are placed there on the basis of some sort of research judgment and the purpose of the study. So for example, uh, research in uh, correctional settings such as prisons and jails, um, a convenient sample may say uh, the first 100 inmates that I encounter, I'll give them a survey. Whereas this one, a purposive sample says, for example, there's a certain criteria that uh, an inmate must meet. So one example could be the criteria is that you must be incarcerated in a mental health unit in a prison. Uh, let's say a staff member has to state uh, you have a history of being violent or harming yourself while you're an inmate. And um, let's say we're doing a study on re-entry after prison or jail. Um, the, the person in the study has to be one year or less from being released from prison and reintegrated <coughs> back in society. So we actually have um, kind of three, almost four criteria here. Uh, one is incarceration status, two is mental health unit, three is staff recognition along a couple of traits, and four is close to release date. Um, and you can do different variations of this purposive. Um, once you have that criteria, you can take the first hundred because there's still not a sampling method, uh, any sort of stratification, any sort of randomization. Um, but those in the sample have certain characteristics. So quota sampling, um, there's non-randomization, but there might be certain quotas that you want to meet. They can be proportional or non-proportional. And the last one is uh, snowball sampling. And these are, uh, this is a sampling technique that's usually um, used uh, with very specific populations. In criminal justice, um, this is often used for ethical reasons and protect participants. Um, so you may access one person and then they may refer you to another person. So uh, a common example here would be if you were doing a study of people uh, actively involved in the mafia or let's say an active, uh, active in a gang life um, and you uh, win the trust and interaction with one gang member um, and you identify yourself as a researcher and then you say, I'd like to talk to other um, gang members and they will then introduce you to them. So it snowballs, meaning as, uh, as the snowball moves down the hill, it gets bigger. And in this case, as your uh, contacts uh, increase, you get to talk to more and more gang uh, leaders and uh, people in the gang. It could be used for uh, also people like snitches or confidential informants, um, uh, people in a cult, uh, 
people, uh, usually in some sort of clandestine group. Um, it's also used often online, such as uh, studies of sex offenders or other groups that uh, don't want to be known. Uh, but if somebody accesses, uh, if a researcher accesses one of these individuals, they can then go and find um, through that connection other people. And so that is um, the final example of non-probability uh, non-probable sampling. Uh, there are some statistics that one can use for non-probability, like even basic ones like chi-squared, just to look at relationships between things, um, though non-probability does tend to lend itself uh, to qualitative research, particularly snowball sampling, uh, because you're not likely to have a large sample size and you're not, it's not random, you're not generalizing to a larger audience.